Anjo Peninsula, in the rugged and remote wilderness that is the East Kimberley region of Western Australia. It's the location of what was known during World War II as RAAF Base Truscott, Australia's secret air base, a staging point for heavy bombers making sorties out across the Timor Sea to Indonesia and beyond. The war in the Pacific had escalated with the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbour on the 7th of December 1941. Within two months, Singapore would fall. And just four days after that, at 9.48am on the morning of the 19th of February 1942, the first bombs ever to strike Australian soil were dropped by Japanese aircraft led by Commander Mitsuo Fukida. From that first raid until the 12th of November 1943, Darwin and the surrounding region was attacked in 64 raids involving more than 1,200 Japanese aircraft fighters, dive bombers, bombers and heavy bombers. No longer an onlooker, Australia was now an active defender of its soil in the Pacific theatre. And defend we did. By late 1943, under the command of General Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief, Southwest Pacific Area, the main thrust of air power was to push the Japanese northwards by attacking targets in the region to Australia's north including Timor, Borneo and Java. But the available airfields, up to 800 kilometres from the northern coast of Australia, severely limited the range of heavy bombers. An airfield right at the northern tip of Western Australia was clearly called for. The existing strip at Drysdale was not suitable for such heavily laden aircraft. The solution was to start from scratch and build a new purpose-built airbase on the Anjo Peninsula. This would afford maximum range for heavy bombers and mine-laying Catalinas, and would also provide vital air cover for ships bringing supplies around the coast from Fremantle to Darwin. Not all of the aircraft based at Truscott completed their missions. At a quarter to six on the morning of the 20th of May 1945, just 12 weeks before the end of the war, one of these B-24 Liberators, number A-72160, loaded to the hilt with depth charges, crashed shortly after takeoff 350 yards from the northwestern end of the runway. The Liberator's pilot, 26-year-old Flight Lieutenant Frank Sismi, and all 10 of his crew, several less than 20 years of age, died in the explosion. Back in Sydney, Frank Sismi's wife was pregnant with their daughter, who would be called Helen. Helen Sismi, now Helen Brown, was sitting opposite me in an historic Australian Air Force Douglas DC-3 Dakota, known affectionately as a Goonie Bird. Together with her husband Bob, Helen had flown from their home in Christchurch, New Zealand, so that she could view for the first time the wreckage of the plane in which the father she never knew perished. Helen and Bob Brown were not alone on this journey. Along with more than 70 surviving veterans and some of their relatives, the Browns had been invited to attend the 50th reunion of the completion of Truscott Air Base. Apart from the Kiwi contingent, the vets had all come from the southern parts of Australia, just as they had when they travelled to Truscott by rail and road during the war. These travellers, most in their 70s, hailed from Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania and New South Wales, flying first to Darwin, then on to Kununurra to meet the DC-3 on the 17th of May 1994. From Kununurra, the Goonie Bird would take them the last 169 nautical miles to Truscott, an hour and a half at a cruising speed of 115 knots. Truscott Base was named after the Melbourne football player and fighter ace Keith Bluey Truscott. Arguably Australia's finest wartime fighter pilot, Bluey Truscott didn't survive the war. On the evening of the 28th of March 1943, along with flying officer Ian Loudon, Truscott was escorting a Catalina back to base at Exmouth. 
Bored with the task at hand, the two pilots made a series of mock attacks on the flying boat, which had been slowly descending over the mirror-like waters of Exmouth Gulf. Great combat pilot though he was, Truscott had always had difficulty judging his height for landing. Over water, in the afternoon light, this proved fatal. On his final pass at 5.35pm, he attempted to fly right underneath the Catalina and quite simply misjudged it. Australia lost an ace and gained a legend. One of the veterans was my dad, Gordon Smith. He'd spent five months on Searchlight Station 12 at Truscott. I'd heard tall tales, some possibly even true, about Anjo for as long as I could recall. Whenever Dad and his mates got together, the conversation rapidly turned to searchlights, gen sets, and shark traps. So I couldn't resist the chance to share this reunion with Dad and see if all the stories I'd heard over the years were true. Meeting at Kananurra, we traded the slickness of the jet age for the noise and smells of a real aeroplane. A venerable old Air Force workhorse for the final leg of the journey to Anjo. As we waited on the tarmac for the pre-flight checks to be completed, it was soon very clear to me that my dad wasn't the only one with wartime stories to tell. It took more than an hour to prepare the aircraft and for the whole of that time the cabin fairly buzzed with yarns. They fixed the compasses out of the three spitties. Yeah, very smoothly done. We've only had two hours to do it today. They get over the tides like out here. They just That's right. Come in on the tide and in the night. We knew about the, you know, the crowd that landed. Down south. Down south. Yeah. And, Did you know about the group that came and lived there for nine months after we left? Uh, oh. Those stories and the reasons behind this unique pilgrimage take us back to the time when this aircraft was built. In fact, this very aircraft was the first Allied aircraft into Hiroshima after the bomb was dropped. So there's a bit of history there. <laughs> three, once the seatbelt sign has gone off, to come up the front and have a look. For some of you, it might be reliving, reliving old times. <laughs> How many people here flew DC-3s? Yeah, flew in them. How many people flew in them? Probably everyone. Yeah. 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 The problems of getting the port engine to fire were treated with typically laconic Aussie humour. I can't skip it, we're, we're oh. getting tired. <laughs> we could have walked halfway there by now by cattle. <laughs> One thing he's tested the motors as well, we can be sure that they'll go. <laughs> Finally, after much coaxing, tweaking and head scratching, the reluctant twin wasp radial engine roared into life and the pilot skillfully matched the revs of both engines. With a cheer from the veterans, the old Goonie bird lifted off, bound once again for Angel. Once cruising at 4,000 feet, we were encouraged to come up to the flight deck, where some even took a turn at the controls. For many of the Anjo veterans, it was a tremendous thrill to fly once again in a Dakota. Conversation was difficult in the noisy cabin, and many of the men remained quiet, lost in thought, wondering perhaps how Truscott Base would look after all those years. Gordon and my stepmum Ray were thoroughly enjoying it all. As the Goonie bird approached Truscott, the mood aboard the aircraft was electric with anticipation. Finally, there it was, the strip. Far shorter today than its original 8,000 feet, but otherwise strangely similar and surrounded by the vegetation so characteristic of the region. The palette of the East Kimberley landscape would have been etched into the memories of these veterans. It's tough country and the rich red earth and 
pale green vegetation would have been strange and unfamiliar to the young blokes who arrived here from Australia's southern states. With a cheer from the passengers, the Goonie Bird finally touched down. Even today, the strip at Truscott is not level, but has a distinct dip about two-thirds of the way along. You can see this as the Dakota almost sinks from view. Liberators from 85 Wing had only just arrived at Truscott from Darwin, and it's possible that the dip in the runway confused Frank Sisme, giving a false impression of having taken off. Another possible cause mooted at the time was sabotage, although the reason for the crash was never officially established. Waiting on the tarmac to welcome the weary travellers was the driving force behind the whole exercise, president of the Truscott Base Tribute Committee and a man who has for decades championed the Anjo legend, Howard Young. <laughs> Bob Brown climbed down, followed by Helen. Thank you, Bebe. Then it was Dad's turn. His arrival at Truscott was all the more remarkable given he'd suffered several strokes, sarcoidosis and a variety of other illnesses for more than a decade. It was a minor miracle that Gordon Smith was here at all. Gordon Smith, how are you? Yes, I have a Obviously, now we've got somewhere over 50 people here. They cannot cook for everybody and pay for everybody. So we need volunteers. We'll be calling for volunteers now to get to we'll try and organise a roster. See that place? The last time that place had anything on it was 50 years ago. The same place as well. I must admit For Gordon and Ray, the chance to see the base from a helicopter was impossible to pass up. Even if it was their first time in a chopper, and even if the pilot had removed the door to give me a better view for filming. This square frame is all that remains of the screen at the illustrious outdoor cinema known affectionately as the Anjo Palace. Here was a row of rusty old Canadian Ford trucks, one of which Dad had driven, towing his searchlight and genset. in Dad's war stories seemed to grow larger over the years, but as we flew out over West Bay, there, idling along on the surface, was a sizeable saltwater crocodile, probably about 14 feet in length. We whipped around so I could get a shot, but the wily old salty dived as we circled, so all I could film was a blurry shape beneath the surface, a sure reminder that, however inviting the water, this was no place to take a casual dip. But swim they did, as Gordon explained. We used to swim around quite a lot. No doubt if it didn't go out too far because the, it was shark infested. We used to get a couple of sharks in there every night in the shark trap. There were crocodiles too. With our personnel, we always had to be on guard 24 hours a day. 
which meant that we had uh, everybody to do the roster of two hours on every night. The main group would sleep in the main tent and the bloke on guard duty would sleep down on the beach. We landed a shark, quite a large one, and we pulled it up on this high beach. We pulled it up right, right off the, off the um, water line and we thought, oh, that'll be right till the morning. And of course, the guard was on, uh, sleeping in his tent. We didn't realise till the morning came that a cock had come in up this beach, grabbed the shark and gone out again. And that would have only been about 10 or 15 yards from where the tent was. Could have been so different. The helicopter gave us a wonderful view of the base, but the best way to see the relics of Truscott was on one of Howard's guided tours. First stop was at that most essential of facilities, the Thunderboxes, standing in silent testament to all that had passed their way so many years before. Helen couldn't but resist trying view. out one of those ancient rusty loos, and she thought the view was sensational. That's the way. Every morning that they would burn them, Oh, yes. uh, they, they'd set a fire and everybody would do their job on top of them, and the next day they'd set fire to them, and of course that would heat yeah. it all up and... Uh, yeah, alternate days. They yeah, alternate days, yeah. yeah. Howard Young loves an audience, and he's generous with his time and his stories. WAF started to replace the radar men as operators, you see, from south, and they slowly moved northwards to take their places. And one of these places was built on the side of a hill, and a lot of rainfall over in the Queensland coast, you see, and the... Um, toilet facilities had subsided in a big storm and they were rebuilding it just as the time these um, wax were coming and they set aside a two holer for the wax and were working on the bottom and one of the blokes was a bit of an electronic whiz and he put a little loud speaker under there <laughs> you see and they waited then till one of the girls came and she settled herself down nicely and one, a voice floated up from beneath I think we ought to make this hole a bit deeper, eh? <laughs> <laughs> a throwing open of doors and emerging of yeah, <laughs> a re-robing <laughs> Now I'd like to invite you into the officers' mess in the 58 ABU. You come over here through the front door. Now, there's the front door, the pot plant, you see. Oh, <laughs> this is the annex. We always had an annex at officers' messes, and I like you to hang your hats and coats up in the front place. The bar's over there in the corner. Yeah, well, gin and tonic, thank you. Gin coming up. It wasn't going to be bettered by the officers' mess having a uh, fountain all of their own. The sergeants decided to go one better, and they built themselves a parrot cage. <laughs> They were going to have an aviary, you see. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, they couldn't catch any parrots. None of them were good enough bushmen to catch any parrots. But they caught some crows, so they put them in. And the sergeant's mess at Truscott was famous for its black canaries. <laughs> Dad had been based at number 12 searchlight station, and he was naturally keen to see the place he'd been confined to, with just eight other blokes, for five months. We searched the area in an attempt to find the spot, but the passage of time and the unfamiliar perspective from the air made it difficult to be certain just which headland was the right one. Shortly after our visit, John and Carol Beasy published their detailed book on Truscott, including a careful drawing of the entire layout of the base. This map shows how the various searchlight, radar units and guns were positioned. Number 12 searchlight station can be seen near the southern shore of Butcher's Bay. Using this information, I was able to search through my helicopter footage, find Butcher's Bay and locate where station 12 had been. Probably about here. It's, it was funny going over in the helicopter. Um, I, I used to write home and say, this is the most God forsaken place we've ever seen. It's mainly rock and more rock and more rock again and how the Japs 
ever wanted to even think about coming here beats me because you couldn't do anything with a, a rock post like this. But then, of course, we realised that there was a strip had been carved out of this land and uh, that was the purpose of it all. But on our particular station, it was just, uh, just rock. And, uh, that was st stuff we had to dig into for our gun emplacements and our searchlight protection and all that sort of thing. It's difficult today to fully appreciate how isolated these blokes felt in their new and totally unfamiliar surroundings. They'd arrived on a coal steamer that had deliberately steered a zigzag course to avoid detection by the Japanese. A rotted, old, rusty coal steamer, not built for human transport, but we, we had about 250 bodies on this steamer and uh, it didn't matter where you went, the funnel used to be in the way and uh, would be belching hot smoke. I parked myself into a lifeboat. We didn't know where we were. We had vaguely heard about Truscott, but we didn't associate that with a secret war base. Gordon was convinced they were not even stationed on the mainland. And even during his interview at the reunion, he still occasionally referred to his time on the island. There was only one boar on the island. There's a limit of one cup per person per day, and that included everything. We were, however, uh, on a ration of three bottles of lolly water and two bottles of beer per man per week. I was one of the few non-drinkers in the whole establishment, so I had a, a field day. I used to barter my um, uh, two bottles of beer for three bottles of, lo of uh, lolly water. And uh, that was very um, much appreciated. The method we used for keeping the drinks cool was to um, get a four gallon drum um, half fill it with sand, uh, put a few bottles in and then um, fill it up with high octane aviation fuel and uh, then we'd hang it out in the sun somewhere and the evaporation would chill, and I mean chill, uh, the drinks which was really wonderful. Somehow or other they were all tainted with this petrol smell. <laughs> but. We got used to that. Access to the more remote searchlight stations was too rough for vehicles, so a herd of donkeys was brought in to ferry water and rations to the outposts. The donkeys were also co-opted into races, such as what was probably called the Anjo Derby. Later on, of course, when we were walking around and investigating, we did find a lot of Aboriginal burial grounds and these were usually in a cliff area. The drawings were done all over the, the rock face with all their wonderful colours and so on. But the actual burial ground itself was just a sheltered area under a cliff. You'd see parcels of bark and they were the remains of some of the uh, original uh, members of the community. This colonnade island here, is it count on? Yes. If you look it up in the dictionary, it stands for small cannon. Oh, right. And in 1929, the Australian Navy found two cannons upright in the sand dunes of that several, uh, I don't know how far apart, I can't remember. Uh, the date, they were Portuguese and uh, dated 1500. Incredible. Now that's historical fact. A common fear expressed by several of the veterans I spoke with was that they were part of a forgotten unit, doomed to be left to perish in this wasteland when the main base was decommissioned and all the others had left. Such anxiety that I think it tipped me over the edge because I didn't know whether they'd come back for me. You remember? You were put by yourself. No, two, uh, two privates yes. and two Aboriginal boys. They were 16-year-olds. I was 
21 coming up 22. It's my birthday today. Oh, oh is it? Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Oh, 72. And of course, as time went on, we always had the impression that we were the forgotten unit. We weren't asking for much, but we got very little. A few of the boys did um, suffer from a tropo disease, which um, you couldn't bl blame them. You didn't. You just wondered when you were going to go a bit stupid yourself. For my father, as indeed for so many of the veterans, yeah. the trip was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Oh, it's just an, an unbelievable experience because it's uh, what happened 50 years ago was just a weird happening in boyhood. And here it is 50 years later and I'm back in the same spot. It's very hard to believe. It always used to seem like a, a bad dream when we came home uh, to realise that part of life was behind us and we'd never get back there again. Um, and here we are, we're back. And uh, it just seems as though pages have been opened out of a large book uh, that we thought would be closed forever. It's uh, a very emotional time, actually, for a lot of us. It was remarkable that Howard Young had actually tracked Helen Brown down, and he only managed it two weeks before the reunion. With obviously mixed feelings, the time came to drive out and view the wreckage of Liberator A72-160. It was a moment Helen had both anticipated and dreaded. to the wing like a giant shock absorber that takes that takes the shock when the aircraft wheel hits the ground. Ray was puzzled by what this aluminium sphere might have been. Heavy bombers such as the Liberator were vulnerable to attack from beneath and were fitted with special armament contained in a retractable Sperry ball turret. This was not a pleasant place to spend a flight over enemy territory. The turret was small to reduce drag and was so cramped there was no room for a parachute or any way to answer nature's calls. Only the shortest crew members could even fit inside, tucked in the fetal position with legs elevated either side of the two 50 caliber Browning machine guns. And there they would lie, often for more than 10 hours, literally waiting to be shot at by enemy fighters. The turret had to be retractable so it didn't drag on the ground during takeoff and landing. If the hydraulics failed, the hapless gunner was trapped inside, awaiting his fate when the aircraft finally had to land. Although extremely uncomfortable, the ball turret emerged as the safest place to be in the entire aircraft. Jim Bigelow was the ball turret gunner in A72-160 right up until May the 19th, the day before the fatal crash, at which time his entire crew was swapped for a new one. Jim spent some time sitting in the remarkably well-preserved turret, thinking about the hours he'd spent in that cramped space and the fate of the new crew who took over the following day. That's what they call the turbo. It was underneath the wing and it reburnt the gases, that any exhaust gases that were still unburnt from the fuel. The exhaust gases out of the engine used to spin that round and at night that used to, the whole thing used to glow red hot and they used to use those exhaust gases again to feed back into the engine and still spins but way after all this time. Helen explains how she heard about the reunion. Heard about it the Tuesday after Easter. 
in a letter from Howard. And I guess that it was a bit of excitement involved in receiving the letter. I've got lots of friends that are very interested. I mean, we weren't just going off on a holiday. We were just coming on this mission and people were really interested. About three or four years ago, I got some photographs of the crash site here. And so I had studied them before I came. I thought that would help me before I got here. I didn't even know the plate existed up until then. I didn't think there was any possibility I would ever be able to come in and see it. So, it, you know, the opportunity of being able to meet at a reunion like this was great. It took courage for a man of my father's age to make this journey. No one who's survived a series of strokes and suffered the after effects of cardiovascular disease as well as a range of war-related conditions, including a succession of skin cancers, makes such a decision lightly. It took courage of a different sort for the woman-born Helen Sisme to finally confront the pile of twisted metal that symbolised so much more than just the remains of an aircraft. Unlike my father, Helen's dad had never even seen his daughter. He had been relieved at the age of 26 from the trials of life, of bringing up a family, of ageing. For the young Helen, Frank Sisme was all too often portrayed as a kind of superhero, someone to whose image she could never aspire. As my father was called while Mum was pregnant, uh, I was born four months later. We lived with his folk, his parents, in family home until I was nine, Mum and I, and she remarried and we went to New Zealand to live. So we moved around from Auckland to Christchurch and I married a New Zealander and I've got three New Zealand kids, <laughs> still in New Zealand. My mother was grieving, I think almost until she died, which was a month ago, for him. All that I know is that she told me that he'd been killed in a plane crash in action. And I don't know that she knew a great deal herself. I don't know that she was told a great deal. To her, he was sort of fairly superhuman and, and it was a pretty hard act to follow as being his child. Yeah. I haven't really had a lot of information about his war activities at all, really, until recently. And I've now come by his diaries. Mum was ill and we had to have her put into care and then we came across them in the home, so it was great to read those. I asked Helen if she knew the cause of her father's crash. I think there's a few different variations from what I gather. Yesterday I was told, I was told about how the plane was taking off to lay mines. It was overloaded as was normal to do this mission and coming down the runway there's a dip in the runway and apparently there's a couple of little mounds and somewhere around there it just didn't take off or else they thought it had taken off. It spun, crashed. After an apparently normal start-up and engine warming, Sisme taxied the plane onto the runway and commenced his takeoff run. About three quarters of the way down the strip, the aircraft's tail light was observed to rise sharply, veer to the left, then drop out of view. The light rose briefly once more, then disappeared before the flash of an explosion was followed by a shockwave that was felt by onlookers. Fire crews raced to the scene, 
but the fire was so intense they couldn't approach. Someone today has just told me that they felt it was the first time my father had actually taken off from here. Now I don't know any more than that. I thought he was based here until just a moment ago and somebody says he was based somewhere else and he had just flown in here and, and he was, it wasn't his plane, he was, um, his plane was being serviced and the crew had been taken off this plane because they'd done their hours and it was the first time I think he'd taken off down this runway and I don't think he knew it was a tricky runway from what I gather from the other chaps today that it was fairly tricky and um, very difficult runway to take up on. Already it had occurred to me that there was a poignant difference between Helen Brown's situation and my own. Sure, I'd heard all the stories and seen the old photographs, but here I was watching my father savour each delicious moment as, together, we inspected the rusty remains of the base. Helen Brown had never heard a single story from her father Frank. For Helen, the photographs had been everything. Her only insights into what little was known of the father who had over 50 years taken on the mantle of tragic hero. This visit provided a far earthier view of what life had been like at Anjo. It's an experience, real experience, to come out here and to see this part of the country to start with. And uh, I think visiting the cemetery on Monday was a very emotional time for me. Went down to the Adelaide River from Darwin and realised that when I got there and using my video that it was exactly four weeks to the day that Mum had died. So it was a bit of a coincidence I suppose but it was quite an emotional time. But I suppose it's, it ties everything together for me doesn't it? I didn't even know about the cemetery. I knew he was buried south of Darwin, that's all, until um, I think it was the anniversary they had in Darwin that one of my uncles had brought me some photographs back because he'd found out. So it's all oh, recent years all this to me. It's not as though I've known about the plane being here. I've actually had out a lot of my memorabilia that I've got at home in bits and pieces and I've been forming a book at home. All sorts of little things have been coming together. Howard is going to give me more information once we get back to Karanara. And there's the official report and things like that. I would like to read those things, yes, which I haven't got. Of course, Bluey Truscott's Kitty Hawk and Frank Sismi's Liberator weren't the only planes to come to grief in the region. This DC-3 ran out of fuel, having overshot Broom. The crew survived, as one of them recalled in a letter to Howard Young, asking if he might attend the reunion. One of the first letters I got, which I still keep at the top of the pile, because I like to read it occasionally, said, Dear Mr Young, I was never at Truscott, but I was close by there exactly 50 years ago today. February 1992 it was, and he said, I was on a DC-3, we were heading for Broome, missed it, uh, and ran out of fuel up near Truscott, and we landed on the salt pan, uh, and we were rescued a day or two later. Can I come to your reunion? So we wrote back and said, of course you can, and he did, and he's a lovely fellow. And this is the Shady Lady, which crash landed on this salt pan in 1943. The wheel tracks are still clearly visible 50 years later. The Shady Lady got lost, had a fight with two zeros over Timor, and made the West Australian coast with dry fuel tanks, and they were going to bail out, and they suddenly saw this salt pan. So they carefully touched down with the last remaining fuel, and ran along the salt pan, and all of a sudden the nose wheel hit a soft patch, broke off, and ended up on their nose.
On the morning of the 20th of March 1944, the Japanese Mitsubishi Ki-46 high altitude reconnaissance aircraft was intercepted flying over Cape Levesque en route to the Drysdale Truscott area where its mission was to take aerial photographs of the region. The various types of Japanese aircraft were given women's names as identification codes. So there were Betty medium bombers, Val dive bombers, Kate torpedo bombers, and this one a twin-engined diner. Three Spitfires were scrambled and closed in on the diner over Van Sadat Bay. The diner was attacked by two of the Spitfires and with its starboard wing sheared off by machine gun fire, the flaming aircraft plunged into the sea. The wreckage was visible at low tide and was later recovered on a barge and transported to West Bay. From there it was disassembled and various sections transported inland for detailed intelligence investigation. This was to be the last time a Japanese aircraft was shot down in Australia during World War II. Two months before Frank Sisme's fatal crash, another Liberator, Old Nick, had been lost soon after takeoff. Under the command of squadron leader NH Fanny Strauss, Liberator A7280 and three others took off on what was planned to be an armed reconnaissance mission over the Bali Lombok region. Within minutes, Strauss reported that the aircraft was experiencing handling difficulties and that he was returning to Truscott to land. Unable to climb above about 400 feet, Strauss was unable to locate the strip, and after a low-level circuit of Vansidart Bay, he realised the aircraft was uncontrollable and radioed to the crew the words, Sorry chaps, I have to ditch it. A7280 exploded on impact with the water, floating for a time before sinking in about 11 metres of water. There were no survivors. Navy divers eventually located the wreck, but extreme tides, strong currents and crocodiles made any further investigations impossible. Showing extraordinary grit and determination, the remaining liberators went on to successfully complete the mission. This day we went for this walk, I was standing on the strip and three spitties came in at no height at all and they did a peel off and one went straight up in the air, the other peeled off to the right hand side and he flew off, the other one didn't have enough height and he, went, he crashed and uh, the pilot was killed instantly. But that happened in front of my very eyes. Um, it was a bit of a shock to a young uh, raw um, soldier and uh, we were, were upset by that for quite a while. For those who had returned to Anjo, there were important ceremonies to be conducted. Formal ways of expressing gratitude to the people of Colombaru and to the staff of Santos, whose generous cooperation had made the reunion possible. We belong to the generations of those made safe. Made safe by those who came here 50 years ago to fight it out. After dinner, a troop of youngsters from Columbaroo treated us all to a fine performance of the legend of the sperm whale. Some of their grandparents had helped build the airstrip, being paid with food and clothing, as well as provisions for their home at the Drysdale Mission. The 
robbery was a welcome lead-up to what would be a very short sleep indeed, as the veterans of Truscott bedded down in the aircraft hangar in readiness for the focal point of the whole trip. The dawn service and the reflame ceremony held at a can constructed right at the wreckage of Liberator A-72-160. Men didn't actually sleep because their minds were just too active. The stories kept on coming with Slim Pierce's voice forming vocal wallpaper hour after hour. But this fellow Dean was so bloody kind to me. He let everybody was going, much, 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 much ahead, you know. He's an army bloke, yeah. Oh, bloody nice bloke. And he says, don't take these citizens, it's good to After a little more than two hours of this so-called sleep, the troops sat bolt upright in their stretches at precisely 3 a.m. No one, it seemed, was taking a chance of sleeping through the dawn service. Some took special care with their appearance. Then it was off into the darkness as the whole group of veterans and relatives made their way to the memorial site. I would like to call on Jim Robinson and Helen Brown to bring forward a list of the names of Flight Lieutenant Sisney's crew and place it in front of you. <coughs> In the Ode of Remembrance we say, they shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. And this is because we remember those who died, like Sisme's crew, we remember them and they live in our minds as young, vital, <coughs> active as they were. If you look around, you will see that the rest of us are not so fortunate. Most of us look a darn sight older than these young chaps here. We creak in the we creak in the limbs. We have to get up several times in the night. We can't run anymore. We are growing old. But they, while ever we live, while ever their children live, while ever their grandchildren live, and remember them, they will stay young. As the dawn light gradually flooded the scene, the ceremony continued with wreaths being laid at the can, poems being read, and of course the lowering of the flag to half-mast and the playing of the last post. With the wreckage of A-72-160 strewn through the bush, it was the most moving of occasions. 
In a sense, families was what this reunion was all about. Wives came to support their husbands. Joe Parker came to lay a wreath for his brother who died here. I met a chap who knew him up here. And um, who actually flew him in here to Truscott um, and for him to fly out the Liberator. Well, he was describing him, uh, his personality and the quiet way and about the way his crew respected him. And it was just nice to hear these things. I mean, I didn't even know Truscott existed. I just knew he'd been killed in action on an air base and I knew he was buried south of Darwin. It wasn't until just recently that I got the photographs, you know, a few years ago of this and this just blew me away and I was unable to tell mum. Mum had Alzheimer's. She died uh, four weeks. I've been out here a number of times and, you know, I've sort of felt controlled. I think the surface has just been a bit moving. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's just incredible, isn't it? 49 years on, to still be here. We belong to the generations of those made safe. Made safe by those who came here 50 years ago to fight it out. They were ordinary people like us, Lord, who missed their families and their loved ones, who didn't want to die and didn't want us to die. There is a word that must be said, and we ask you, Lord, to help us to say it with meaning and with love. The word is thanks. We thank you, Lord, for the servicemen who came to trust God, who lived in the bush, who checked those skies for the enemy, who prepared their planes for war. We thank you for the lives of those who did not return. We thank you for those who died in this very place without even leaving our shores. We thank you, Lord, for their lives that they put online for this land, Australia. <laughs> 